All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to session three of our first arts integration professional learning opportunity uh, presented by the Maine Department of Education. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, I'm Jason Anderson. I'm your visual and performing arts content specialist at the DOE. And we're very pleased to have with us again, our guest presenter, Sherry Norfolk, who is a uh, wonderful, wonderfully talented teaching artist uh, and does a lot of work with the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts and Wolf Trap and does work all over the country. Um, and she is based in the center of our country in Missouri. We're so thrilled to have her. And today, um, I believe we're looking to do a little bit of a show and tell, Sherry, right? We're hoping that we might be able to do some show and tell uh, of some lessons and or units that you might be looking at or a lesson or, or unit uh, that you might be looking at from an arts integration lens. So Sherry, I'll turn it over to you and you can lay out what we're gonna do for the first part of today. Thank you, because I am so excited to hear about the arts integrated lesson plans that people are thinking about. Um, it always just, it always inspires me how very creative um, these our art teachers are. And so I just wanted to very quickly talk about um, what we're gonna do. And I'm gonna share screen here. That's wrong. Um, so you can um, volunteer uh, when you want to go. And um, you're gonna have eight minutes to present your lesson plan. You might demo some of it. You might just talk through some of it, but let us know the grade level. And uh, if not quoting the standards, but just kind of what core content you're addressing and what fine arts you're addressing. And then we are going to be giving you feedback for five minutes. And it'll be in a very non judgmental way. Maybe I noticed. I noticed that you provided um, a pr that there's a product that allows us to do summative evaluation. Um, and then I wonder, uh, which might be in the form of a suggestion, I wonder if you tried this, what would happen? Um, and then we will ask you if you have any questions. If we have time in that five minutes, do you have any questions about any element of your lesson plan that you would like some feedback on? Um, as we are listening, we will be thinking about the Kennedy Center definition of arts integration, um, that arts integration is an approach to teaching in which students construct and demonstrate understanding through an art form. Students engage in a creative process which connects an art form and another subject area and meets evolving objectives in both. So as we're talking about what we notice, we'll be noticing how your lesson plan um, fits into that definition. We'll be looking for these things to happen. Um, is there a chance in here for students to be acquiring factual information and basic skills? Um, is there an opportunity for them to construct meaning of important ideas and processes? Is there a transferring of the learning and um, applying it in other ways? And finally, we'll be looking for opportunities for formative assessment and summative assessment. And you know, you're only going to have eight minutes, so we're, we know that we're not going to see all of that probably in that time, but those are the kinds of things that I would like for us to think about as we are hearing these presentations that I can't wait to hear. So who would like to go first? And trust me, we're under no impression whatsoever that anyone has a finished product ready to roll. <laughs> so, you know, even if it's laying out what you got so far and then um, filling in the gaps for us a little bit, well, you know, I'm thinking about going this way, I'm thinking about doing this. Um, yeah. We just, yeah, we're just interested to hear what your thoughts are. And uh, so, yeah, if anybody wants, doesn't mind being the first, first to go, so we want to blaze the path. And it occurs to me that it may be the most useful if we just, in the feedback, if we just start by asking you, do you have any questions that you would like for us to help you address? Mm. So um, if that's what you want to do, you just tell us, you know? So, um, all right, Jessica. Does that mean you're volunteering first? Yeah, so I'll go because I think mine is the worst and the least creative. <laughs> oh. And so by the end of us sharing, everybody would have forgotten about mine. Oh, okay. This is a key strategy of mine. I <laughs> Highly doubtful, first, Jessica, that any of these are going to be Except bad. probably this little speech I'm giving now will probably 
ruin the forgetfulness aspect. So, and now we're so going to focus I, in. I, do, I don't know how to share my Google Doc on the screen. You, you should and, down at the bottom. You should have a share screen button. Yeah, but it isn't it just going to? Won't it just share the Zoom meeting screen? No, nope, it should. You can pick. You may have to minimize your Zoom window to find another window. So you you might be able to, you may not be able to see us for a minute as you're presenting, or we might be in little boxes at the top of your screen or down the side. But if you click share screen, then you should be given an option about which which screen you want to share, and then you minimize this window. It's asking me security and pri. Uh, I don't know. Um, share screen. And then it gives me whiteboard, iPad, photos, yep. Google. Does it say, does it say screen okay. one? No, it says desktop one. Click, on click desktop. IPad. Yep, click yeah. desktop. Open system preferences to gain access. Just go ahead and click okay. I'll see if I can walk you through this. It's been a while since I've had someone. Sorry. No, it's okay. okay. It's not a problem. Now it wants me to quit Zoom in hmm. order. So Don't apologize. Art teachers might know about this Japanese artist named Yayoi Kusama, who lots of art teachers uh, pull out of their bag of tricks this time of year because Mrs. Kusama is a very eccentric Japanese artist who's obsessed with the shape of a pumpkin. Um, so I do her lesson every, t every year this time. I do, I, I cover her with second grade or first grade every year this time of year and we we I have a I have a book creator book created about her and we go through my book on the Apple TV and we look at images of her we look at images of her art we look at the setting of her art we talk about her art what it looks like what it reminds us of we're pretty th thorough in our conversation and I actually this is something I did this week so I can talk from experience. So the boring ELA aspect of it was that last week we learned about Mrs. Kusama. This week we did a, a review. And when I said, who can tell me what they remember about our overview of Mrs. Kusama, I stood at the whiteboard and I wrote out the sentences that each second grader offered out loud. And then when we had about 20 sentences on the board, I had them, they had to come up and circle um, words that we use a lot in the art room, which forced them to read the sentences over. So they had to, they had, they were finding words like create and make and use, and they were finding words that represented colors like red and yellow. So then they were forced to reread the sentences on the board and circle words that they found. And then because I'm now doing RTI in the classrooms, I realized that second grade is doing singular to plural. They're changing singular nouns to plural nouns. So I had them try to find all the plural nouns on the board and we used a different marker to circle those. So it was just me getting a little bit into some ELA work and attaching it to my lesson about a contemporary artist. And that's it in a nutshell. And I don't know any of the common core standards that this applies to, but I'm sure there are some. There, there are tons. Okay. <laughs> I, I assure you okay. there are tons. Um, so how, how do you, what would you like from us? Do you want us to tell you what we noticed and, 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 or do you want to ask us questions? Well, what I noticed is that a couple of kids at the end were like, I really like this. Like they liked having ownership over the, over the whiteboard marker and getting up <laughs> and doing word searches, because I think they're used to doing word searches on, on worksheets. And so, but it was more fun to do it as a group. Um, but how can I make that, how can I stretch that more? How can I turn it into not a group writing, but a personal writing with children that can really barely write at this point? I mean, they've done it a, a year and a half in COVID. Their writing skills are, I mean, sure, they could word search, but writing complete sentences might be a struggle. 
Um, but I would love to stretch this even more and continue learning about her. I know there's a couple of picture books out there about her. I would love to continue doing this more almost with every fine artist that we that we cover. I mean, what type of ELA work can I do with fine artists that I cover, which is not every week, but you know, maybe twice a semester, um, just to stretch it out, make it more personal. Any ideas would be welcomed. <laughs> I have okay. an idea. Jason, I, I have an idea. <laughs> so I know, right? So one thing that I did when I was in, um, when I was back in Vermont teaching general music, I had a bank of music specific terminology and I would have the students and these are, these were seventh and eighth graders. So they could write, um, but they weren't used to writing about music using art specific terminology. So I used to put all of the cards in a basket and I would, a big basket, and I'd mix them all up almost, it, almost looked like a, a potato barrel and I'd mix it up and I would have them reach in and pull out however many, if I, you know, I sometimes I would give them the option and say, do you want to do three today? Do you want to do four? And we did it as a warm up activity in, in the classroom. And I would challenge them to write sentences based on, because we had music every day for, they had music every day for one whole quarter. And wow. even though they didn't have music the whole rest of the year, I at least got them five days a week for a whole quarter. So I could cover a lot of ground with them. I would have them use those terms to write about what we had done the previous day. And then we would, and then I would have them put their sentences either up on the smart board. They could, you know, we'd put them on the projector or they would write them on the whiteboard. And then we would look at, um, we would look at sentence structure a little bit. It required me to have to go back to school a little bit when it came to sentence structure and making sure that I was doing things well. And it didn't hurt that I was in graduate school at the time either. So I was really practicing working on my writing. Um, but that was, a that, really, that was a really great way. So you might do the same thing with visual art and take some of those terms that are grade level specific, right? Or, or um, appropriate, and then help them to figure out how to craft sentences using those terms. So that's one suggestion I would make. I love that. And they could even do it about, you know, the this Japanese artist, I, I guess her name is, I say Yayoi, I might be saying it wrong. I, so I call her Mrs. Kusama a lot. <laughs> we could even, I could, they could even craft sentences about her specifically or about their own personal work that was based on her. Mm -hmm. I love the flashcard idea and the reaching in because kids love diversion from the ordinary of just mm -hmm. sitting in their desk and listening to us over and over and over again. <laughs> and I feel like I tend to do that because I only see them once a week and I have, I have so much I wanna cover that I don't often branch out from, from that, that model of teaching where I do, I introduce, I do the mini lesson, they get to work, but it would be nice to, to, to divert from that a little bit. I love the flashcard idea. And Lisa, before you jump in, I just wanna chase that idea with, Jessica, if you make a set of flashcards for your class, make a set for the ELA teachers as well and, and tell them what you're doing and see if they will reinforce that in their classroom. There yeah. you're making that connection. You're doing very simple work to help support them in that, but you're allowing your art material to make its way into their ELA class. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I, I, like, I like the manipulative aspect of the flashcards. Mm -hmm. It's kind of equal to me handing them that dry erase marker and being like circle a word on the board. Okay. It feels like a game too. Lisa, what did yeah, you have? Yeah. Well, I was just gonna say that in my fourth and fifth grade art room, I have a whiteboard that's just art vocabulary. So at the beginning of the year, I put A through Z and I was just looking, searching for a picture, it didn't come up very quickly. Um, and so I'll start out by putting art, artists, create, um, you know, the elements, shapes, basic step, paper, pencil under the, under the letter of the alphabet. And then as we start to do whatever we get into, whether it's an artist or a technique, um, 
then I'll add all that terminology under the right letter. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of white space at the beginning of the year and there are words that are jammed in at the end of the year. And like today, for instance, um, I mean, if, if they have a chance, they have all sorts of suggestions as to wor words like, oh, you forgot to put trace up there for T and I have a suggestion for Q. And one student said, could the word quiet go on the art book? Uh, yes. And I said, well, it could, but not in the, I need you to be quiet so you can hear the directions, but what about like having a quiet environment? Do you feel like that's important for your creativity and to get going? So, so I said, if you agree with that, I'll put that word up on the board. And so it's up all year. I had a, a kid who might, might've been, I can't really remember, might've been slightly autistic, but this kid would come in the room once a week and go, oh, you put a new word on the board. And I'm like, how can you spot one word on this board with 26 letters and a zillion words. And so- um, Cause he watches so, everything you do. Yeah, so they really, um, they seem to be really engaged with that. And um, so artist names go up there, techniques, um, even just things like, you know, big idea and persist, all the studio habits, all, you know, so all those things come up or go up on the board. And it really, I think for them shows that it helps with their visual literacy, but how many words, just how many words can we, um, are, that there are. So helps it's with describing our critique. Word walls, word walls are fantastic. I love looking at them, particularly at the end of the year. I don't have any space. I share a room with the music teacher, but someday maybe I will have a word wall, but I can even do it in the cafeteria or in the hallway. I could find my own space for that. Thanks for reminding me of that. You know, a year and a half really outside of the norm, we forget things that we were once inspired by. So this is good. Thanks for reminding me about word walls. I completely forgot about them. <laughs> that word wall means that when kids are hearing about Mrs. Kusama, they're looking at that word wall and thinking, oh, that applies to her. That, yeah, that art term applies to her. Yeah. So it makes those biographies that you're sharing um, even more meaningful because they're seeing that these artists actually live by that, that these are things that, that apply to them. She definitely does. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Who's next? Okay, Lisa. I'll go next for Jessica's same reasons. <laughs> <laughs> um, so- You can't, uh, listen, you can't all have the worst presentation. It's not possible. Um, so just, yes, we can, Jason, yes, we can. Ours was so far the very best, so look. <laughs> what what I'm gonna do, because I'm gonna be honest, um, and, and at about quarter of three, I went, oh, crap, I was supposed to do something for today. <laughs> but, um, so sorry about that. Um, but last week when we were in our breakout room, Suzanne Goulet started a document and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just touch on that a little bit because um, it's just kind of an idea board for, um, we, we talked about working um, together, so not necessarily just one school, but in the Waterville schools and to hit social and emo emotional learning connection, have a community connection, some a service-based aspect, um, and we wanted it to be based on water. So we have the Kennebec River running through town, um, as well as um, the Mesolonsky stream and many, many lakes. So, and I'm not gonna read this whole thing all the way through, but I'll just touch on some. Suzanne had an idea of compassion cups uh, where you create a series of three cups, each decorated with a sprig or adorned with a stamp created by a 3D printer. So bringing in some technology, they keep one cup, they give one to someone else. And then 
um, to have a tea party with to kind of slow down, a gift of time, and then the third to be sold to generate some funds towards whatever um, idea. Wow. Um, Jessica, our Jessica added an idea inspired by the Sarah's Long Walk the Water project. And Sarah was in our in our group with this um, and a yarn bomb project that I did and then Suzanne's water main ideas and outdoor canoe experience. Um, so her proposal is a project designed and conducted by art teachers in Maine to bring awareness and raise funds for a Maine Native American group working to keep Maine water bodies healthy. So she's um, laid out a number of things about how to bring this about um, and I don't I'm not going to go through that whole 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 thing but um, she tapped into Sarah's peace flags and using natural materials that art teachers would um, create lessons around our main Native Americans. I'm, I'm sorry, I just saw, I just saw one part and I passed it by. Um, but it also just shows how we can address more than one issue in a project. So we'd create our specific age appropriate curriculums and then um, work with teachers from other disciplines if that mm -hmm. worked out. And, it, and you know, we do main studies um so there's a lot of tie-in with the water the environment science um so and that's um middle school or high school well it's anywhere from elementary or up kind of upper elementary through high school so yeah and i could i could definitely see that working um through yeah. from like four through 12 grades four through 12. Um, so that would get the whole community involved. Mm -hmm. That would be so exciting. Yeah. And, and I, I would see the science teachers definitely want, wanting to buy in on that. Yeah. Definitely the process um, offers all kinds of opportunities for assessment. And so does the product. And these are such amazing products that are, that are going to be coming out of it. Uh, did you have any questions that you wanted us to answer or would you just like to hear input and comment? Just, I guess any feedback and and same as Jessica, I you know, when it comes to standards and again, I'm going to be honest, I'm like, you know, pretty much anything, everything we do is going to hit one, some standard. Um, so I don't ever really overly worry about it because um, it's going to hit one, one or more standards. But um, but just any feedback on that, so. Well, what I was excited about was how how integrated it already is, the ideas are. Uh, and, and, and they're so community-based as well, that it gives you the opportunity to reach out to uh, not just the other teachers in your building, but also people in the community to, to work together on something. And it would also, I think, lend itself to reaching out to other kinds of arts, not just visual art, but to music and to theater and to dance, to, to bring some of those ideas to life for other people. Would that be something that you'd be thinking about doing? Um, I, I could certainly see that that, that that could happen. And I think at least in Waterville District, our music teachers, I could, totally see them being open to that. And we have such great resources between Colby and people up at Orono. And I mean, there's just so many great resources now in the state um, around mm -hmm. um, our Native Americans. And so I, th I think, um, but focusing specifically on water Mm -hmm. I that mean, you know, as a storyteller, I was immediately thinking of stories <laughs> yes. um, that I would want kids to help write and, and then to have them tell yes. and to go out into the community to tell those stories to build more of a team 
to to work on the project so um and, and i'm a printmaker so i'm totally like oh we could do some great water images we could you know using water as our in the process to yeah. create water like images and and that i could um and and that helps could help anchor kind of a printmaking session um so so that got me excited as I was reading through some of the ideas, so. I also yeah. like the way you have the, whoever's, whichever one of you was doing the canoeing mm -hmm. to actually be physically in what you're studying about. I think that's, it, it just is so visceral. It, it you know, yeah. it makes a connection. Yeah. So, and Suzanne does it a, a lot with outing clubs. So I think that that was from her. So it's not something I would think about. I would totally do it, but I wouldn't think about that first. So it's great that she has that. Yeah. Any I other love, comments, suggestions? Yeah, I was just gonna jump in if I could, Sherry, and just say, I love Lisa that, you know, I've been, as, as we've been, hearing things today and over the last two sessions, the first, first two sessions we had with you, Sherry, there are two, two distinct ways that you can look at arts integration as an arts educator. You can say, what do other content, what does other content area knowledge, non-arts look like in my space, in my lessons, in my units? And what does my material look like outside of my space in their classrooms, right? And I think that this is really building a great foundation for helping to bridge that gap about what your, what, what we do in our strange space as arts educators, right? There's this weird magic that emanates from our room that some of our other content colleagues are, are too mystified by to like open the door and take a peek in. They kind of go by our rooms really quickly, right? Because they say that there's some strange magic in there and I'm not really sure what it is and I don't really understand it, but I'm just gonna go by quickly. If we're able to sort of make that practical for them through something like you've just laid out, I think that that's a, a, that is a, that is a, a, a wonderful first step to really building that those bridges between you and other content area educators so that it's not always about, well, how can I, incorporate math into this? How can I incorporate language into this? But how can they incorporate art into what they're doing? And it's that, it's the, both of those perspectives to keep in mind, I think. But I really think that this is a great start to, to building both of those perspectives at the same time. Okay, thank you. Okay. Did, you wanna, did you wanna hop in, Barb, or did you wanna be next to go? Yeah. I'll go next if everybody's ready. Okay, we're ready. <laughs> okay, I'm going to open up what I did. I well, I, I I talked to a lot of the elementary teachers and what they're working on at this point. Um, and I will share that, and then I will share what it's it's like a quick put together of what I we're working on. So let me see if I can get that shared correctly. Um, I'm going to open that up. Hold on. I got to get it here. Uh, okay, that's there. That's there. Okay, I think I'm ready. Let me see. Okay, I can do this. Where is my share screen? There we go. Um, I'll start with this one. Okay, this is what I've got. This, I mean, just a little tidbit here. Um, for math, the kindergarten are working on sorting and they're working on community members. Uh, firemen in the grade one, working with additional facts to 10. ELA is short vowel sounds. Grade two is working on measurements and grade four is working on multiple step word problems and science they're working on landforms. Um, and so these are just little quick notes that I took. And so what um, I did to try to put something together, <laughs> it's still a work in progress by far, but um, I decided to start with the uh, uh, landforms uh, for the grade four and putting them together. So like my lesson one, um, students would discuss what they learned in science about landforms. And then we put together, cause we right now we've been, we've been, Halloween is almost done, but we've been working on flashcards and matching flashcards um, characters to um, um, rhythms and stuff like that. So 
to carry on from that. Um, they'd make flashcards that include various landforms and rhythm notes for each. For instance, this is just a, like if, for instance, this uh, flashcard would have landforms underneath it would have the rhythm of what landforms sound like when you play it on a musical instrument um, and volcano. Uh, what that would sound like and like so we've been talking about this triplet like in the Adams family we've been playing around with that um, um, dun, 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 like that and so we go volcano lake <laughs> we could even add to it um, the different rhythms to that um, so lesson two after we do all that um, I figured that we would probably be at talking about the theme and how we put the theme together for landforms um, and we'll discuss like making an a section um, and what the song would be about. So we'd like make a story kind of like, um, okay, this is, this is what um, we're gonna keep, the A section is gonna be the part where we go keep going back to, this is what it's all about. And then and when we would get to lesson three, we would talk about how to, we would divide the groups. Uh, so each one would choose a landform that they would want to emphasize um, and put it in a four beat phrases and and then the ideal thing for the ending product would be that everyone would chant the A section in the rhythm with the rhythm, correct rhythm, and then the groups would do their own B section and then would come back to the A section. So it would be um, um, that kind of thing. Like I said, this is very fast put together and it's very messy, but um, that's what I have. <laughs> so far oh i can't hear anybody what um uh, what is the grade level for this particular one grade four this is grade four yeah. and so they're learning um music theory that is so exciting yeah 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 so they're doing music theory as well as the um so their science uh put together with the music theory right yeah so um i have what kinds of, did they come up with a, a poem? Um, yeah, that's what the, the idea is to come up with um, like a poem that, so that it, once they get their poem put together, we can put the rhythm to it. Um, yes, that's, that's the idea anyway. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it's really fun. <laughs> yeah. I, I also do too, and I don't know if I'm on. Well, I think it's so cool that music, I mean, it always is amazing to be able to see what you guys in music do, because it, for me, it's really alien. I mean, it's really hard, but um, when you combine science with music and, and so they're learning their science through their music that they're learning at the same time. That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. It is. And it is I, I mean, I can think of all kinds of like volcano flow, blah, 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 volcano yeah. flow. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's why they create. Yeah, absolutely. That's why once you start opening that door, it's like, wow, I never thought that's cool. Let's put that together. Let's, let's add that to our mix and stuff. It's like a lot of brainstorming. So, and that's what happens. So are they learning about de deconstruction and constructive um, ways to, for landforms to be created? That I have to communicate with the teacher more off, a little bit more about to see and, and the kids when I talk with the kids and yeah. the teachers on um, what is it that you're um, that's what's part of that discussion. What have you learned about landforms and what sticks out with you the most and um, because I'm not sitting in her class, so I really don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Barb, I have a really wild idea. Now oh, roll cool. with me on this. I think this, I think this could be really cool though, even for fourth grade. So there are lots of great pieces out there that use landforms as their inspiration. Like I'm thinking about Freddie Grofe's Grand Canyon Suite, I'm thinking okay. about Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Hopefully. Spring, thinking about yeah. the Appalachian Mountains. Um, uh, I'm sure I could come up with a list of others, but they're oh, Night Hi. on Bald Mountain, right? Mizorski? Yeah. Is that Mizorski? No. <laughs> Who was that? Anyway, Night on yeah. Bald Mountain. Now, here's where the wild part comes in. So listening to those pieces is great, and identifying themes in that is something that is right up a fourth grader's alley, is figuring out where themes are. If we say that in a piece of sheet music, when you can find a theme, 
it's like finding a landform, which is like a, a, a big target on a map. Now you could weave in some actual map reading so that they Whoa. are finding their thought. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Bring Absolutely. in a map and say, here's, you know, can you find the major landforms on this map? Now on this musical map that we call sheet music, can you find the landforms, which are the themes? So, you know, in Night on Bald Mountain, you would find do, 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 and they would see what that looks like on a piece of sheet music and then go find that on a map and say, oh yeah, here's, here's a mountain range, you know, and maybe it's where Bald Mountain is, you know, where the inspiration came from. So you could do some geography and topography and music and the literacy and all of that. <laughs> maybe even went. theater. What about oh, theater? Dance. That too. Performing. I wish I, these, I wish I had these kids every day. <laughs> that would be yeah. so much fun. It's like when you only see them once a week, it's like, oh, remember what we did last week? <laughs> but that is so cool. I like that. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. And take it away, Sherry, for the theater aspect. Sarah well, teed it right up there. There are um, hundreds and hundreds of how and why stories about how landforms are made. You know, so if you look at the Pecos Bill and um, Paul Bunyan stories, they explain how the Grand Canyon was made or um, all different kinds of things like that. So I have kids make up their own stories about, they look at the landforms and they, they choose one and they make up their own story about how it was made. Okay. And what is interesting to me, every time I've done this, um, and I never give them this instruction, but every, as they're writing their story, they're making it up and it's, it's completely fictional, like, you know, a daddy dragon whacked his baby dragon and he fell and um, that turned into Taiwan. It's that, it's that realistic. But as they're writing the story, somebody will say, I wonder how it was really formed. Yeah. And then they'll go, can we look it up? Yeah, you can. Why don't you even write a, a little thing at the bottom of your story to explain how it really was formed, you know, like a paragraph. <laughs> and they do every single time. And then when they tell their stories, if they forget to tell the kids exactly how it really did happen, the kids always ask them. So um, they're getting into that. And that's why I was asking about deconstructive and constructive um, things. And so they could even write a little uh, song about that, about how it was made. So, okay you know, that it crashed together and slipped over. And now that's how they formed a mountain. And they could, they could compose a tune to that story, Barb, that is shaped like a mountain range or shaped like, you know, a valley or if it's got mountains. And then you can add some harmony to that. And then they could, next thing you know, you may have students performing on, you know, they may have two, two different orphan instruments that they're performing on that they're able to complement each other. Yeah, or what instruments would um, represent the sound of, you know, the volcano erupting or the land cracking or that kind of thing. Okay. You'll probably need about three years to teach this unit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to happen right away, that's for sure. <laughs> it's well, sad, or I maybe, I to, I, I maybe she'll need today. more days a week. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I talked to my principal today and I told her what uh, this exciting class that I'm taking and how integrating because we had talked about this last spring about um, in getting the teachers involved with more integrating and stuff like that. And I said, you know, that's really cool. But I wasn't really quite ready to get it started this year. And then when I saw you had this post, I'm like, hmm, this might be good. And then, of course, it's too late to do my professional goals on this. But next year, I told her today, I said, I think my professional goals is going to be all about integrating. <laughs> And That's I awesome. think, yes. Yeah, so, because yeah, I wish I started it this year because I my professional goals are really, blah. but anyway, <laughs> I'll be ready for next year for sure. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. That was great. So, Jason, should we take our five minute break now? Or should uh, we, we could, do it? Uh, yeah, because uh, um, we have Sarah and Alexis left to present. Um, so, yeah, why don't we take five minutes now to get up and stretch and get some water and get some fresh air or whatever, and we come back, um, we'll have Sarah and Alexis do a little song and dance of what they've worked on. And then, um, and then we can expand out a little bit more from there and start to talk about bringing this in for a landing on our next session. Okay. All right. This is exciting. Great stuff. <laughs> Thank you. 
Oh, we can't hear you, sir. Do you want to go? I don't care. I'll go. Why not? <laughs> um, also, I don't know if the message went through, but my power went out in my school. So that's why we I, that sure. <laughs> and then I was in my car leaving and then I looked at the school and the lights were back on and I was like, <laughs> Really? Like, so, I like, so then I grabbed my back. My, I came back in and I was like, "Here I am." So, um, glad we had that little break there for a second. Um, so, uh, in my group last week, we threw around um, just some topics, and um, I can't remember who said it, but someone mentioned like birds and birds migration. So I came up with a fun. Well, I think it's gonna be fun um, idea of doing a um, unit, a little art piece about bird migration in Maine and um, students picking a bird um, by researching. I think they'd probably bring their iPads in and maybe they go to like the Maine Audubon site. Um, and there, I know that I looked up, there's some articles on what birds um, do migrate in Maine and um, creating a cool, um, I always say, I don't know if I ever say it right because no one's ever corrected me, mobile, like mobile. We say mobile, it's mobile, right? No, <laughs> I always feel like I'm not saying it right. Um, sure, <laughs> go tell me, Lisa. <laughs> Sorry, like a mobile. That's mobile. Okay, mobile. Yeah. I like. I <laughs> always don't even know which one I'm saying is right either. So. Are you saying like things that are hung from like? Yeah, like Alexander Calder, Calder mobile. mobile. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, potato. So, potato. Thank you. Yeah, I, I like say the wrong one every time. I'm like, oh no, I mean this one. So anyway. Um, so uh, I came with this, I was gonna um, have students, uh, I, I kind of have like two age groups and like two kind of possible ideas. So like for older students, like fourth and fifth grade, um, I was thinking they could go more realistic and actually like look at the birds more closely um, and try to work with like texture and all that. And I kind of made a like a very rough idea of what this would look like. So bear with me, but um, basically like make the sides of the birds, it's like a little Oriole. And then the wings, and then like fit it like this. So then they all are flying oh, up on the, and I think I'd hang them all up in the hallway. Um, but I also was thinking I could go with um, the artist, um, Charlie Harper, and with the younger kids, where that's more geometric, looking at shapes and um, kind of simplifying it. Um, but um, I guess like I, I could go still with him for the artist for the um, older kids, but I guess I was gonna ask if you guys had any ideas of what what um, certain artists would be good to connect with this that do, because I know there's a lot of those artists who do more abstract. So um, I don't know if you guys have any ideas for that, but um, one, I guess one um, standard that I was gonna connect with this was um, that I know besides just like, you know, elements of art and skill and all that, but um, just the part of presenting the artwork and helping hang it, things like that would getting the students involved in the actual presentation of the art piece. But yeah, that's my only kind of question was like, what artists would be, um, would you connect with this? Because I, I know some, but I, which one would you do and why? Well, with the older kids, I would this is just me because I used to work in an Audubon gallery, but I like real Audubon gallery. I yeah. would, I would touch on John Jang's Audubon and the, his importance to um, the study of American ornithology and okay. his history in this country and his travels across the United States. Um, I think he stopped at the Mississippi River, but I think mm -hmm. he was pretty thorough. Of uh, the the east side of the United States, documenting all the birds, the history of how he did it's really fascinating, and he was almost destitute by the end of it. I mean, John James Audubon is a great story to tell an older level of student, mm -hmm. younger okay. kid, and that integrates like social studies, American history, all of that jazz. I mean, he's he's also part Creole. He's got, he comes from sort of a shady background. Um, so that can touch on a, a lot of, you know, American history. Um, and um, the younger kids, I like your idea of using Charlie Harper. I like your idea of using shapes and geometry. And also I think, um, 
I want to say deep space sparkle, but it could be another one that does a, a bird lesson that's fantastic using geometric shapes that might inspire you if you just like watched it or Googled it, it might be inspiring for you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't think about researching um, him specifically. So uh, yeah, so I'll look that up. Thank you. <laughs> um, I know that Holly Hubbard, our K new K3 art educator did a great Charlie Harper bird project with the students that she had at the Montessori school. It was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I could connect you with her with that. And then at the Colby Museum of Art, probably three, a good three years ago, possibly four, maybe not quite that long. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a teaching artist at the museum okay. and we did a whole bird, it a whole bird, it's all about birds, mm -hmm. silhouettes of birds. We had, there was a lot of material. I was just doing a quick look and I, again, I, I think I'm <laughs> I'm just slower than I used to be. I couldn't find it, but I can totally share all that stuff with you. Um, we did a lot of silhouette cutouts and um, there was just a, a nice deep, I, I don't even remember all the artists that we, we covered and why we were doing birds, but we tapped into Maine Audubon, um, a lot of bird sounds and the, the black silhouettes were up on these windows all over the place. So I love the idea of the birds hanging in the hallway because mm -hmm. that's just gonna make such an impact. But these silhouettes as well would make, they make an, just because it's black, they mm -hmm. make an impact. Um, and um, so I, I'd be very happy to find that with not on the spot and share that with you, all the bird yeah. stuff, so. That'd be so helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm trying to remember. I remember being at the Colby Museum and seeing quite a bit of bird stuff a while ago, but I don't know if it was the same thing, but um, it probably it was probably was. And there was a book on James Audubon. It was a children's book. And um, but so what at, as teaching artists, we school groups would come and they would go through the exhibit and then we do a studio um, experience with them typically is what we do. Um, that's been changed somewhat over the past couple of years and, mm -hmm. and this year too, but, um, but it's, I've got it somewhere. I've got it okay. somewhere in my archives. <laughs> I'd love to, just love to have that. Thank you. Okay. And I'll, I'll probably look, I think I'll probably look up on the web on like Colby's website or something. There's yeah. probably pictures and stuff too. There I'll may be. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Hi, Thank Jessica. you. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, if you wanted to with the older kids, you could touch on the huge tragedy of bird extinction that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. John James Audubon did document and illustrate a lot of birds that are now extinct. And we have such a great record of them because of John James Audubon and how he would trap them, kill them, because so he was part of the problem. And then he would um, illustrate them painstakingly. And so you could talk about the ones that are currently extinct that we have illustrations of because of these guys back in the 19th century. It's just an idea. Thank you. Yeah, that's great to know. Um, yes, Sherry, thank you. <laughs> oh, we can't hear you. You're muted, Sherry. Thank you. <laughs> um, we can also connect with animal adaptations. Um, here in Missouri, at least we studied that around third grade and kids are super excited about learning about that. And, you know, if you look at different birds, why does the spoonbill have a spoonbill? How does that help it? And, and how does the flint, why is a flamingo pink? Those kinds of things. And then you were talking about having them present their work. Mm -hmm. um, I like to have kids, create their own wax museum. They are the wax, the wax museum figure. Okay. And in this case, they could actually kind of dress like their, their bird. 
Oh, that'd be fun. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I would be a blue jay and I would wear something blue and, and with some a little bit of white and black and and then I would say, Hi, I'm a jay. Bah! And <laughs> explain um, all about myself. So I would have to use I'd have to try to uh, approximate the call of mm -hmm. the blue jay and then talk about um, whatever you want them to talk about feeding habits, um, where they live and things like that. But um, that way they have a really fun way. And uh, a lot of times they put like a dot on their hand and people come by and they touch the dot and they come to life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that's cool. it's fun. <laughs> it is really fun. I just love to go around and push all the buttons and hear all the kids. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you know, Alexis, I, just to piggyback on what Sherry said, I, I would, I would vigorously defend that approach of doing an activity like that as an extension with your kids. If anyone says that's not, you know, that's not visual art. What does that have to do with visual art? What is it? It's, it is making all of the learning deeper for them. It's tying together and having them process. It, it may not be recognizable to them that they are thinking about these things again and again and in a different way and like a Rubik's cube, right? And twisting it around and looking at it from different angles. But doing something like that is such a, uh, a dramatic, pardon the term, but it's, you know, it's a dramatic extension to what they were making in the visual art. They'll remember all of that so much more vividly if you can tie something in like that. And that's sort of, that's something Sherry and I were talking about before you all came in today, which is trying to get everybody out of their comfort zone a little bit more. And, and you might have to stretch your own self out in this and say, I'm not really, I've never done anything like that before, but it's this sort of communal learning with your kids that they're, you know, they're going to have a great experience with that as well. But I love that idea, Sherry. That's so cool. Yeah, that's really cool. I didn't even think about that. Like just them to getting to like, just think about that way of being a bird. <laughs> like, that's so cool. Thanks. <laughs> Sarah, you had something you wanted to pop in with. Hold, hold that thought, Jessica, just a second. Sarah, did you want to throw something in? Well, the one thing, uh, Alexis, that maybe it would be cool is if your kids did birds that were local, so many nature centers or, or like, land trusts have um, buildings and it would be really cool for the kids to be able to display their birds in the buildings in the local community nature air programs. Yeah. And then I just wanted to say one other thing. There's this really cool artist in North Carolina called named Bryant, Hol Bryant Holsenbeck. And she makes birds out of found material. And you might want to look her up because mm -hmm. Her work is really expressive and, you know, it, it's not quite as, is anatomically correct, mm -hmm. but it's, she does a lot of animals. Great. Thank you. Do you mind um, writing her name in the chat so I can, I can write it down later. I just did. Oh, you did. Oh, you did. I did it before. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Jessica, Thanks. you want to throw something in? I can't remember. Sorry. Um, no, that's okay. I it was just a little side comment off of what somebody else. Oh, I remember what I was saying. What when you, when Jason was saying like defend the tangent you take your lesson on. Do we really need to at all? Because I mean, what we know so much about this world and the history of human civilization mm -hmm. because of art. Mm -hmm. Art Art isn't just the hand making something, mm -hmm. it is the telling of the story of our world. So do we have to defend going off on tangents at all? Because everything is related to art in my opinion. Uh, and I don't disagree with you. Let me frame that statement a, a little differently. I think it depends on your audience. I wasn't attacking you. I was oh, just Oh, no, no, I get you. I get you for sure. No, but I want to make sure that, it, that, that I'm clear on that because I think that, I think it depends on your audience. I think you don't have to defend it with the kids unless they're like, why are we doing drama in art class? In which case you could talk, Alexis, about, about design and thinking about bringing your artwork to life. And, how, you know, there's all these other great connections that, you know, opportunity for them to play that they don't have necessarily in any other content class that they have during the day, right? This is a, a mm -hmm. great opportunity for them to be able to get some of that play out. But then Jessica, I think about the 
I think about the parents that call or write emails or your principal comes down and says, people have called me and they want to know why you're doing this and all that, you know, so it's, it's about having, it's about having the, the inviting mindset to say, I'm trying, I'm, I'm doing work with arts integration. This is a real legitimate approach to teaching. This is very popular in other parts of the country and in all over the world. And I'm trying to enrich, you know, so you have, you have those basic tenants ready to go for when you need them, right? But that's, yeah, but in terms of defending it, you're absolutely right. There should be no reason to have to defend it. But I bet Sherry could speak volumes about having to defend things, you know, to people that are just not as open-minded uh, to thinking about education in a different way. Right, right. So that's kind of where I was coming from with that. We need the vocabulary ready in order to talk about what we're doing. Precisely, precisely. Yeah. And that's, a, that's part of this process as well is starting to build that vocabulary for you in this first series that we're having for this year. And Sherry's doing a great job of helping us build that vocabulary with that Kennedy Center core, you know, core competency for arts integration is really helping us a lot with that vocabulary. Sarah. I think you're last to present. <laughs> okay. Um, Alexis, one other thing I just wanted to say, because I was thinking about it. You know that there's, you were talking about mobiles, but there's also a way you can make birds where you pull, there's a cord underneath and its wings are on a hinge and you can pull it and it just does this lovely um, movement. And you might, I could look it up because I've done it with the kids, but I can't remember I don't have the instructions, but I could put it in, you know, the chat thing. Yeah, if, that'd be great. You thank know. you. I didn't think about that. Yeah, thank you. That'd be great. I'd love to try to try to figure that out too. <laughs> so, um, uh, I'm I'm do I'm doing mine now because I I'm sort of in engulfed in it. So I thought I might as well just tell you the one I'm doing, and then I, I'd love a lot some feedback on how to sort of make it more cohesive but um we our school is really big on on integrating just everything which i like and um the 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 third grade well i should preface this with i was on a residency the first month of this of school i was down in arkansas and i i wonder if you're anywhere near eureka spring sherry arkansas no okay anyway i was down in arkansas and um, so one of the ways I could justify going was I worked with schools down there and we're, we're doing sort of a thing between the two schools. And they, we, we did this printing of the peace flags um, as part of, well, let me, let, me, let me reframe. So I'm working with third grade and fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, because six through well, uh, six through eight are all studying like uh, um, earth science or water in some way. And third grade is studying rivers and land masses. So um, I tried to do this program where I do STEAM and art. So in STEAM and, and, and in ELS in the older grades, they're reading A Long Walk to Water. And so in STEAM, I'm, we, we talked about, we charted our water usage um, and, and then graphed it and we graphed it and then we graphed it against other, uh, like the nation and then the uh, world. And then we talked about how, how data can skew results, like some of them didn't get like they didn't measure how much water they used to wash the dishes, say. So we talked about how uh, the scientific method can be skewed by not having accurate or uh, enough data. And, and then, then um, and I'm, I'm doing this, I'm sorry, I'm feeling like a little crazed. We're also uh, in art where, well, in, and then it, as a, um, continuation of that, we were talking about doing a service project because we are relatively fortunate in this country in Maine that we can turn on the tap and drink water. And we talked about 
and watch videos of other areas such as Africa. And because they're reading A Long Walk to Water, um, they know that South Sudan, you have girls specifically have to walk with something on their head two miles a couple times a day to get dirty water. Um, and so we talked about ways that we could work to raise money to build a well in South Africa. So the, we troubleshoot, we brainstormed ideas of ways to raise money. And I mean, the kids were really into it, which we, I was a little weird. I wasn't sure if that was gonna happen. And this was, so back to Arkansas, I had learned a technique when I was teaching over the summer uh, a block printing technique. And I thought, wow, we could do uh, peace flags. And I would have the kids down there do peace flags for the kids up here and vice versa. We'd send them back and forth. But then the kids wanted to use that for their one of their fundraisers. So we've been printing these flags. Um, and and um, so we sort of, science is sort of finished with it. And then math was what they did was the math teacher bought in and she got the data of, or like what we spent on the materials. And then she used it in the math class so that we could figure out, um, you know, what we were, we we're selling the flags for $10, but what did it really cost to make the flags? I mean, you know, there's all the materials that it costs and sending it out and blah, blah, blah and free teacher time, which I'm doing over weekends ironing. But I mean, they calculated that. And then in the third grade, because they're making the flags too, but they're not reading a long walk to water, we're, we're, we're tying in um, uh, doing research on water symbols throughout history and throughout um, the world. So I know this sounds sort of disjointed, um, but it, like English is working on it, science is working on it, math is working on it, and the upper grades are working in the lower grades. So, um, and I really believe it, really believe that it's important for kids to understand that if they have agency and change and they can see the change that they want in the world and they actually do it, then I think it makes them more able to do that in the future. So a long sort of convoluted, um, but blah, there we go. That is such a rich project on so many different levels. So I have one, um, not exactly a suggestion, but a thought, a, thought, a partial thought. Um, and that is when the community needs to know about what you're doing so that they will buy the flags and they will support the kids and so who tells the community how is that communicated I forgot, I forgot that was one of our that was one of the projects in the upper grades we talked about we have to get this project out there and we're going to do a whole bunch of different fundraisers like in a month we're going to make wreaths so we needed to put a, a poster out there that would say we are doing this stay tuned for what's going to happen to raise money. And then we put um, the kids made posters about selling the peace flags that went out. And it also went out on our Facebook page and um, my Instagram. I want to see the peace flag. Yeah. Can you show us one? Uh, well, um, I can show you. Yeah. Hold on. Well, these are all the raw peace flags. Um, and these, these are the blocks that the kids shoot. Can you see that? The yes. blocks that the kids carved. Um, and so the flags, the kids can use their own um, stamp or other, these are kind of rotten, yucky ones, but they can use their own stamps or, or other stamps. And I have all these colors. And so it's, uh, and here's one. If, are they patchwork? Or are you sewing? Oh, they're that kind of flag. Yeah. 
They're and they're all made out of raw cotton, and they're so they're sewn onto a, a string, and each there it says peace and in be, this is it was on the floor, in between each letter there's a stamp that is just a, a you know a design. So there's there's thir there's eleven on each string of peace flags, and each flag stamps <laughs> each peace flag stamps. You use four of these, and we talked about they did designs a lot of them. The older kids, where when you when you put the design together, it makes a pattern. You see what I mean? So this is four stamps. But putting it, bloop, 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 you turn it 90 degrees and it makes a pattern. And then, then we did water symbols. That's a Celtic water symbol. So, I mean, the older kids did more sophisticated ones and the younger kids did, you know, and then we talked about, you know, using different colors and, and um, the, the younger kids did fun ones. I mean, I love them. They're little like monsters and um, it just was a lot of fun. And it's something I don't, I'm not a printmaker. So this was like a whole new thing for me. It's like, this is so cool. <laughs> so anyway. Okay, so I want to go back to. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, and so I just keep thinking that um, the kids need to tell the story of why this is important. Okay. And, and I mean, really tell the story because the data is impressive, but people don't pay attention to data for the most part. They do okay. pay attention to a story. And so, you know, maybe create, recording the story on YouTube or something or on the school's Facebook page or, um, but having kids tell the story and in, folk, in folklore, there are literally thousands of stories about the importance of water and about um, drought and the impact on people. So they could find those or they could write their own. But I think that that would take it, um, it takes it into ELA, but it also takes it into the performing arts of okay. uh, actually creating and telling the story. So would they tell the story about what we're doing? Because they could they make could do a that. video, a movie. I think, yeah, and I, I think you could have some kids who are telling the story of what you're doing, but you could also have some kids telling the story of why you're doing it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. because the why is important too, right? I mean, that's... So supporting that by telling the story of why, that's what tugs at people's heartstrings and they, they shell out the money <laughs> to, to fund the, what you're doing. So, yeah. Thank you, I will. And I'm sure Sarah, that a lot of the, a lot of the glory of this project is in the details. And you know, one thing that Sherry and I were talking about uh, before you all came in today was the difference between the, the nuances, not necessarily the difference, but the nuances between uh, different approaches to arts integration and then say like a thematic unit. So, you know, in a thematic unit, everybody may be approaching the same uh, topic or the same subject, but they're still doing it sort of in their own cocoons, right? In their own silos. And I'm sure you have a lot more detail in how you all are working together in how those, you know, the, the art room tentacles make their way into the math classroom and into the ELA classroom and how it's all wrapped together in one big school-wide package. Um, and that's where sh I think what Sherry's getting to a point where when you give students an opportunity to reflect on their learning for this big school-wide theme, school-wide project, they will be able to articulate these connections in ways that if you even laid it out for them on cue cards, they still couldn't make the connection better than just letting them talk about how this experience has connected them. And that's something I think that gets primed from all of you as the content teachers that are all working with the same theme and saying, starting to work with the kids on helping them to see those connections and realize where some of that's going. And that's easier for older kids than it is for younger kids, right? But younger kids are, are remarkably perceptive. They will pick up on connections that you didn't even imagine that they would pick up on. Thanks. I, I, I like the, yeah, I think 
you're right. I, I, I'm going to figure out a way. Well, I'll talk to the kids about how they want to maybe just talk about what the whole project is and maybe make a small movie. Yeah, maybe one of them can go on television and talk about, you know, in the, in the news programs. Here in St. Louis, we we hear from a lot of kids on the news programs. You know, they're trying to find the good the good stories, and there aren't. We have so many other stories to tell, but um, they they let kids come on and talk about what they're doing in school. That that's this impactful. I mean, that story needs to be told, and people need to be hearing about this great this great project that you all are doing. So, yeah, you, I think you can find a lot of ways to do that. <laughs> I, I would like to buy a flag. <laughs> okay, you could. I would be happy. They're ten bucks. We've already made eight hundred dollars, so um, I'm a little bit nervous about taking more orders. But I'd be happy. I would love for you to have a set of peace flags. Well, I put my email. I sent you a private message with my email. So oh, let, okay. Let okay. me know cool. how I can pay you. Let me know how I can pay you. If you go on Sedgwick's uh, Facebook page, Sedgwick Elementary School, there's a Venmo that you can, oh, okay. Okay. if you want to, but yeah. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> well, thank you all for taking time to present. Uh, you know, again, I circle back around to what Jessica led with, which is I'm gonna go with mine first because it's probably the worst. I don't think there were any bad ones in the bunch. I thought these were all fantastic and they're all in varying stages of development. And that's the way this goes, right? So hopefully you were able to extract a couple nuggets to help you get maybe to that next uh, that next step or that, that next chapter. So, so Sherry, I don't know if you wanna help focus us on how we're gonna bring this experience in for a landing um, and well, kind of frame maybe what our next uh, session is gonna look at or finish this one up for, for a moment. But um, let's talk about what this next session, um, what the most productive thing for you guys would be for the next session, because what we had said was that maybe you could um, go ahead and deliver some of this arts integrated content and then we would talk about um, the exciting triumphs that happened, uh, the learning experiences that happened, uh, places where you might want some more input. Um, these are big projects, though, that all of you are talking about. So I'm not sure that it would be realistic to think that um, you would want to try to, to get some of that rolled out this week and then next week have a chance to talk about it. So let me know what does that sound doable or um, is there something else that we could do? And my next thought, just before you, I shut up. Um, <laughs> I was also thinking that because of where you are in these projects, it might be more useful to you to do some more thinking about them, um, integrate some of the ideas that you heard today, um, talk to some of the content area teachers that this would be impacting and, and maybe get their input. And then we get back together again next week and have this conversation again, because this was such a rich conversation for each of you. I was hearing so many great ideas uh, adding to what you were doing. I would love to see where you go with that. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think, yeah. We, should, I think we should try to take bits and pieces of what we learned today, the feedback that we got today, and try to apply it either to get started on something or to have a conversation with a a homeroom teacher or in some regard use this advice and then come back and talk about it. I love yeah, that idea, Sherry. That that second idea of of reaching out a little bit further and seeing if you can get a few more concrete pieces to take you to that next step or to help you yeah. figure out where which direction the project may go. Because in your mind right now, without having those conversations with those homeroom teachers or those other content uh, teachers that colleagues that you have, you may think the project is going to go one direction, but once you talk with them, you might figure out that, that it actually goes a, another direction entirely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we went in a zillion directions with each of these projects today. 
And some of those are going to land and you're going to want to use them and they're going to make sense. And others are going to, you're going to say, well, that's really good. And I'll try that some other time, but right now I'm going to go this way. Um, but I found that when I have all these great ideas and then I start talking with the teachers, as Jason said, it typically will take a little bit of a turn to, to make sure that it is covering the content they need. Um, and sometimes there's something they're just struggling with. They're really struggling with this particular thing that you can do just like that. So I love the idea of your um, working through this a little bit more in the coming week and, uh, and then getting back together again and having this conversation again to hear where you are now. Does that all make sense? And maybe we could do if we have, um... If we have Jessica Hamilton Jones and Suzanne Goulet back with us next week, maybe we can carve out a little bit of time to hear what they have to share. Um, and then we could do some small breakout room with some random pairings where you could uh, you could do some of the sharing and this talking so that it wouldn't have to necessarily be, we all sit around and listen, but we could do some small groupings and just what I call it one time speed dating for Zoom. Yeah. That <laughs> kind of going in and out of rooms and you know, having an opportunity to just have a, 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 a one, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversation or having three people in a room or whatever. It might be just a different way of, of doing that. But I love the idea because I think you're going to bring back challenges that you may run into in talking with your other colleagues and wondering how you can overcome that. Maybe you, maybe you hit a wall in trying to appeal to them to try something and so it's just about that hive mind mentality of, oh, well, did you think about framing it this way? Remind them that, you know, it, when you're talking about the color spectrum in, in, um, in the science class and rainbows and all of that, you know, we have that in visual art. We talk about the color wheel and the relationship of color and how colors are made and all that. So, you know, sometimes they just need a reminder of that. And we just sort of need to remind each other about how to do that as well. Yeah. And as, you, um, as you're talking with content area teachers, don't forget to talk to the other arts teachers. You know, if you're a visual artist, um, talk to the music teacher and see if there's some way that the two of you, that they could bring in their art form into, into what you're thinking about here. Because the richer you make it, the more perspectives that you bring to any kind of learning environment, the more opportunity kids have to learn. You know, um, I didn't, I hated history, hated history. I always got A's in it because I was pretty good at cramming all the dates and names into my brain the night before taking the test and then forgetting every single thing. But I never really knew what history was until, until I met my husband who has a degree in history, um, but is also a, a storyteller who tells the story of history. He makes it, he makes history about people and he brings those people to life. So I actually care about it and learned about it. And so now I know a whole heck of a lot about um, Westward Expansion that I didn't know before. Um, but, I, but I got A's, see, because I could memorize. But what we are doing by bringing the arts to it is we are bringing all those different perspectives. And for the kid who needs the story, you know, or the kid who needs the visual, or the kid who needs to sing it and hear it. Uh, we can bring all those different perspectives and and make it sing, make them, as Jason says, take it deeper rather than shallow. And I love the ideas you guys are already working with. It's going to be so much fun to hear about, more about next week. <laughs> Absolutely, for sure. So does that sound like a good plan for everybody to just sort of Keep going a little bit deeper, wait a little further into the pool uh, on your idea and see what you can flesh out a little bit more. Yes. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. So that's how we'll sort of structure next week. And then um, from there, I will have a, um, I'm going to have a little bit of an exit uh, survey for you at the uh, end of next week's session, because it's the end of the series. And the lights are flickering here at my at my supervisor's house, so I'm thinking the power maybe is going to go here pretty soon. Um, so I'm trying to hurry up and finish this up. Um, and I'll also have a link to your professional learning certificate as well that you'll be able to claim uh, at the end of next week's session as well. And we'll also talk about you know whether in 
three or six months, we want to extend out uh, and do a follow-up, you know, after you've had a chance to really finish baking this idea and then presenting it to students and seeing how it goes. And we could, you know, I'm sure Sherry, we can look at Sherry's schedule and, and see if we can get her back for a, a session and um, do, a, do a debrief and sort of talk about how things went a little bit. I think that could be exciting as well. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Very good. Well, thank you all very much for your time today. I appreciate it. We're going to get done a little early today, but thanks again to Sherry for helping to facilitate today's uh, work. Thank you all for sharing, and um, we'll see you next week, same time, same channel for our, our last session here in the series. So have a great week, everybody. I know it's the end Can't of the wait. quarter, so hang in there. Yeah. You can do it. <laughs> Happy and Halloween. Nice. <laughs> and we'll see you next week. Yeah, for sure.